at our fears Emmanuel, we're waiting here For your promise day Where joy will stay We can hold grief in both our hands Paws sliding, tail wagging, side cramping giggles. I can hear it from across the house. Your joy burrows its way through the cracks in my armor. Sorry, there's a spider crawling all over this place. <laughs> okay, hopefully it found an... Oh, there it is. Oh, I injured it. Sorry. No. <laughs> Sorry. I can hear it from across the house. Your joy burrows its way through the cracks in my armor. And then we are both laughing, gulping for joyous electric air. And that's when I know 
if you grab my hand, if you ask me to dance, if our weary human souls can make room for connection, then we will survive. Joy will take root. Love will keep her keys to the house. A poem by Sarah Speed. Good morning. How's it going? How are we doing? There, excellent. A uh, few announcements to lift up as we gather here today. And first off, we're not even going to do that. Go back one slide. Oh, there we go. We're just going to sit there for a moment because it's the easiest way to do this. So if you were sitting at my table at book study on Wednesday night uh, when we were gathering to study the Will Willimon book, you would have heard a really great conversation about art um, and how the only bad feedback for art is no feedback at all, right? Um, whether you get good response or bad response, the, the idea behind art in all its forms is to actually evoke some kind of response from its viewers or its listeners or, or whatever the case may be, right? So last week we started the Advent series, How Does a Weary World Rejoice? And the theme was, we acknowledge our weariness and man, oh man, I must have done some good art. Because <laughs> y'all responded um, either very positively or very negatively. So I'm not up here to apologize, but I want to address a couple of things. First off, this is an Advent series, and so we're going to be moving, as Advent does, from darkness to light. This is the theme of Advent, right? But more importantly, we got a lot of feedback about the logo that is currently sitting on the screen here. I'm not sure if it's sitting on the screen at home, but you'll see it throughout. And so I'm going to explain the logo a bit. It's also on the banners behind us. Um, you may have seen it in the video if you were paying attention at the, at the beginning. It's meant to be the world with arms wrapped around it from above and below. And so two people hugging the world. And the person above, you can see the kind of the bright lines of joy coming off. And the person below, you can see the, the colder, curved lines of weariness coming off. And this entire Advent theme is supposed to kind of question that idea of how does a weary world rejoice, right? In O Holy Night, we hear the weary world rejoices. And our question is, how do we do that? when we are tired. And so last week, we acknowledged our weariness. And I'm glad you all went there, um, whether you're happy about it or not. It will progressively get lighter for those of you who are wondering. It's supposed to. This is the season of Advent. We start in darkness. We move to light. We've done the darkness. It should get progressively lighter as we go. All right? But more importantly, by all means, keep responding because it means the art is doing its work. We have poetry, art, music, all of it kind of coming into play all throughout. So the, it is to elicit a response. That is the hope. We want you to engage with it. We want you to continue to give us your, your sources of joy on the board outside. There will be images that are going to be going up this week that people have brought in as well that, that point to their joy. So like we're, we're trying to do this to actually encourage a response. So that is the logo, but again, there's a certain part of it that maybe you look at it and see something totally different. That's what we're doing in our Bible studies on Tuesday mornings right now, is looking at images, looking at art, and, and sort of sharing what it is that we actually see in it. So you may look at it and see something totally different, and that's the idea. That's what art is all about, right? So all we ask is that you engage, right? Positively or negatively, let us know how it's going. But uh, we are in a season of moving from darkness to light. And apparently we did that really well last week. And so we're going to try to continue to do it this week. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. First up, Christmas and Advent services. Uh, Thursday, December 21st at 7.30 p.m. will be our longest night service here at McDougal. Um, all of the services will be both in person, on site, and online. Um, Sunday, December 24th, 10.30 a.m., there will be a Sunday morning service. That will be Advent 4, because this is that weird year, as I explained at the beginning of Advent, where the fourth Sunday of Advent happens on the same day as Christmas Eve. It only happens once, like, every six or seven years. 
Welcome to this year. Uh, then at 4 p.m. we'll have the family Christmas Eve service. There are children that are already practicing their pageant lines for that one. Um, 7 p.m. will be the traditional Christmas Eve service with communion. Uh, then on Sunday, December 31st, there will be church here at 10.30 and online at 10.30 as well uh, for the, the Sunday after Christmas. So you are invited to any and all of them, again, either on site or online. All of them will be provided. All of them will be offered throughout. Uh, last chance to purchase your gift cards for Christmas pickup. Uh, today is the last day, the last chance to place those orders. Uh, it's a great opportunity to support the church at no cost to yourself while also making Christmas shopping easy. And a reminder that today is the deadline for dropping off your gifts for the angel tree. Next slide. We're still looking for delivery drivers, and you can sign up on the website. If you missed your opportunity to participate, they're still accepting financial donations as well. It takes a lot to run this hamper program. If you would like to support it, uh, the support would be greatly appreciated. Uh, thanks to everyone who participated this year, and stay tuned for all of the, I guess, the reporting back, the information on how it all went. There is a concert happening today at 2.30 here at the church, uh, the Season of Stars concert. Uh, tickets are $20 and can be purchased, I think, online at Eventbrite. Is that the... Um, but if you need some help with that after worship, if you would still like to purchase a ticket, um, then by all means just reach out to, to either Jen or myself, or one of us can help you get hooked up um, with Eventbrite to order your tickets. Ladies Fellowship is meeting Wednesday, December 13th at 10 a.m. in the M&M room. You're asked to bring an old Christmas ornament. Okay? That's all I got. Bring an old Christmas ornament. I'm not a member of the Ladies' Fellowship, so <laughs> I can't give you much more than that. Uh, and then lastly, as always, gratitude. Thanksgiving for all of the ways in which you support the ministries of the church. Uh, all the ways in which you support the programs and the services and the, the, all of it. All the ways that we try to be a beacon of hope, especially in this time of year. Uh, your financial support, your time, your talents, gifts of your presence, your prayers, all of it. It all makes a huge difference. It all makes the world of difference to so many people. So for all the ways that you give of your time and yourself and your financial gifts, thank you, thank you a hundred times, thank you. And if you would like to offer a gift, if you are at home, the ways to give her on the screen. If you are here in the sanctuary, there are also baskets at the back of the church for you to make your offering. If you're really feeling adept, you can scan the QR code in the bottom corner and do it right from your phone, I recommend, during the sermon. <laughs> oh, no, wait. Joanne's preaching today. I don't recommend during the sermon. <laughs> and so with that, I'm going to invite you into our call to worship. And our call to worship today is a little bit different. It's a repeat-after-me call to worship. Hey, 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 there was like one or two. There we go. Welcome to, worship. Welcome to worship. I am glad you're here. Surely God is in this space. I see God in your face. Let us worship together. And so, friends, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our opening hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We will sing verses 1, 2, 6, and 7.
Good morning. How does a weary world practice peace? By listening before we speak and saying sorry when we need to. By advocating for justice and caring for our neighbor. By practicing Sabbath and forgiving 70 times 7. By choosing grace over hate and opening the door for each other. There are a million ways to practice peace. So today we light the candle of peace as a reminder and a charge. With God's help, may we bring peace into a weary world. Amen. And friends, let us remain seated as we sing Hope is a Star, verses 1 and 2. though we are waiting patiently to light the Christ candle on Christmas Eve, the Christ is always with us, so we light our Christ candle as well. The last time I saw God face to face, I was looking at a bed of tulips. God was every color of red. I was merely mortal in awe of it all. The time before that, we were tying back the curtains looking for stars. God was the deepest purple and the brightest light. The time before that, the city was soft with snow. God was the quiet that tucked us all in. And in between these small gifts, there were newborn babies and sapling trees, homemade bread, the sound of a church singing on Sunday. Why, yes, we are lucky. We are more than lucky for the moments when delight and awe unzip the weight we carry around. May it be so. Amen. And so, friends, as we gather in our centering prayer today, I will say the parts that are printed in yellow, and I will invite you to respond with the parts that are printed in white. Before we do that, though, a note that we are going to uh, hear a new sung Lord's Prayer today at the end of our centering prayer. And all I want to invite you to do today is to close your eyes and listen to it and hear it and pray the Lord's Prayer in your hearts as you would say it in whatever words and tradition and and format and language brings you closest to God as you hear it. But uh, not expecting you to be able to sing it, not expecting you to be able to follow it today, just listen to it and let it wash over you as the prayer that it is intended to be. And so with that, let us enter into our centering prayer. I'll say the yellow, you say the white. God of laughter, God of open front doors and family reunions, we confess that we often doubt good news. We 
Instead of leaning into joy, we lean into scarcity. Forgive us for forgetting that joy. That for, forgive us for forgetting that joy is amplified when we share. Heal the wounds we have from past hurts, and teach us how to throw open our doors like prison. Show us how to find joy in Family of faith, I imagine that when we come before God with the truth of our lives, God meets us like Elizabeth meets Mary in our scripture that we will hear today. The door is thrown open. There is laughter. There is joy. There is embracing, and it is holy. So trust this. Believe this. You are claimed. You are loved. You are forgiven and you are sent to serve. Find joy in that. Amen. And so, friends, as we prepare to pass the peace, I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able. And we have a responsive piece that we will say today before we pass the peace with one another. So if you could stand as you are able. And I'll get the next slide. And I will say the parts in yellow and invite you to respond with the parts printed in white. We believe that joy is a sacred gift existing on a plane deeper than happiness, stemming from the truth that we belong to God. We believe that joy is not meant for isolation. Joy is meant to be shared, leading us together in laughter and in hope. And when joy feels impossibly out of reach, we believe that part of being sacred community is leaning on one another. So together we say, I will share my joy when yours runs out. You will share your joy when mine runs out. And in so, we will both see God. Amen. And so, friends, joy is meant to be shared, and I invite you to share the hand of peace. Let us pass the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. 
and also with you. Pass the peace amongst yourselves. At this time, any children who would like to join Dana, he's at the back of the church to head down for a kids' table. Thank you. 
And so friends, as we pre prepare to gather for our prayers of the people, I have a few prayers to lift up from the community. And as we certainly were speaking about last week and certainly the theme of Advent all the way through, and probably the heart of the Christian tradition is that we can bring all of the good and all of the bad, all of the joy and all of the struggle, all of it with us into the presence of God. And I have both this morning. So we will begin with prayers of gratitude from Jerry and Phyllis Tyndall. Uh, their great-grandson, Braylon, you may remember back in, uh, earlier in the fall, we were praying for Braylon uh, in the hospital with substantial complications, and uh, Braylon is now home from the hospital and breathing on his own, so they are grateful for all of their, uh, all the prayers of this community, um, and grateful, obviously, for uh, what is still going to be a long road ahead, but signs of progress and hope in the midst of it all. We also have the other prayers as well to lift up today. Uh, prayers uh, for uh, Ray Jickling and Ray's family on the passing of Chloe Jickling after a lengthy struggle with Alzheimer's. Prayers for Sherry McFadson on the death of her brother, Jack Nolan. And just late last night, Prayers for Lori Megley Best and Greg Best and family on the passing of Mary Megley. And so I would ask that as we pray together today that you would hold in your hearts these families, the gratitudes and the grief, the joys and the sorrows. We would hold all of it in your hearts as we pray together. And I'm going to invite you to remain seated as we sing the first verse of our prayer song, Joy Shall Come. God of today and God of tomorrow. We come to you this morning to thank you for the way that joy binds us together. Thank you for contagious laughter, for inside jokes, for stories around dinner tables that can make us laugh until we cry. Thank you for comedy shows, for the familiar sound of a loved one's chuckle, and for the universality of smile lines. What a gift you have given us, O oh God. Let us sing.
God, the story of Elizabeth and Mary reminds us that joy is better when shared. So today we thank you in particular for the Elizabeths and the Marys in our lives. Thank you for the people who spark joy in us. Thank you for the people who pull us out of our shelves, who, or our shelves, who teach us how to dance and show us how to laugh. Thank you for those who declare, blessed are you. God, we take a moment of gratitude right here to silently lift their names to you now. And so we sing. Holy God, although we know that joy is better when shared, there are days when that is easier said than done. Like Elizabeth, who stayed in isolation for months after receiving her good news, we too have a tendency to choose fear over joy. Without the help of someone at our door, we can often keep our joy to ourselves. So gracious God, when those days come, when the waters of fear rise, when isolation steals our joy, we ask you to comfort us. Comfort us like a shepherd with their flock. Gather us into your arms and carry us to safer ground that we might experience joy in the ways you have in store for us. And until that promised day, like Mary and Elizabeth, we will do our best to keep finding one another. Like Mary and Elizabeth, we will do our best to open the door to one another and to you and to the joy that connection brings. And so we sing. And so, friends, our next, uh, our next scripture song here is one that is going to be a uh, one-part solo and one-part congregational participation. They will sing the verses. We're going to invite you to sing along with the chorus. And so we will begin with the chorus so that you can hear it and start to sing it along. Just remember, folks, make a joyful noise. It doesn't have to be in tune, right? <laughs> Let us sing. O oh, comfort ye my people, tenderly speak to Jerusalem, tell them that their war with me is over, tell them their 
strife is at an end. Okay, that was good. So we're going to start that again, and now we'll sing that again. And then Jen and Justin will do the purple, and we'll sing when the blue comes up again. Comfort ye, oh comfort ye, my people. Tenderly speak to Jerusalem. Tell them that their war with me is over. Tell them that their strife is at an end. Comfort ye, my people. A voice is calling, clear the stubbled road. In the barren wilderness, a highway. Straighten every path that once was bowed. Every valley lifted up. Every mountain be laid low There before the eyes of every race Shall the glory of your God be shown Comfort ye, oh comfort ye, my people Get thee up upon the mountain sing Tell the wandering people that their lives are grass, flowers frail and lovely as they cling. Comfort ye, oh comfort ye, my people, tenderly speak to the ones I claim, tell them that their fight with me is over, tell them that I know each one by name, and the a shepherd feeds her flock I will gather every lamb carry them and lead them when they seek my care where they call upon me so I am comfort ye oh comfort ye my people The reading this morning is from Luke, chapter 1, verse 24 to 45. It's about Mary and Elizabeth and their shared bond of God's blessing. Sometime later, Elizabeth conceived. She went into seclusion for five months, saying, Our God has done this for me. In these days, God has shown favor to us and taken away the disgrace of having no children. Six months later, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a young woman named Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. Upon arriving, the angel said to Mary, Rejoice, highly favored one. God is with you. Blessed are you among women. Mary was deeply troubled by these words and wondered what the angel's greeting meant. The angel went on to say to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You'll conceive and bear a son and give him the name Jesus. 
deliverance. His dignity will be great, and he will be called the only begotten of God. God will give Jesus the judgment seat of David, his ancestor, to rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will never end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have never been with a man? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Hence, the offspring will be born, will be called the Holy One of God. Know, too, that Elizabeth, your kinswoman, has conceived a child in her old age. She who was thought to be infertile is now in her sixth month. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary said, I am the servant of God. Let it be done to me as you say. With that, the angel left her. Within a few days, Mary set out and hurried to the hill country to a town of Judah where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Messiah should come to me? The moment your greeting reached my ear, reached my ears, the child in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that what our God said to her would be accomplished. May our hearts and minds be warmed by this connection of hope and joy. Just a few little um, things to share before uh, I begin. First of all, last night we had about 100 people here for first uh, doing gingerbread houses. About 50 people did that. And then about 50 more or 40 more joined them for dinner last night, a wonderful dinner of ham and potato, uh, potatoes with all the trimmings. And it was a labor of love for those who were in the kitchen. Not everything went as planned, but we all ate and we were fed and it was wonderful. So those of you who helped in the kitchen in particular, just can you just stand up so we can thank you properly. Uh, we finished with a concert that put us all in the Christmas mood, and it went over time, but you know, all was good, and it was a wonderful time. The second thing that's just come to mind through the service is how much, especially in Advent, we talk about Israel. It's in all our readings, it's in all our singing. We sang an Israeli hymn today, and... Because of politics, the way they are right now, it hits us in a different way. Do you find that? Israel has a long history with God. And we have shared in that history. And that history has been times of celebration and joy and knowing that they are the beloved and chosen people. And there's a long history of Israel turning from God. In fact, that song we sang, Comfort Ye My People, is the beginning of what they call Second Isaiah because things have gone horribly wrong for Israel. And they're in exile and everything is going awry. And God comes and says, Comfort my people because my war with you is over. We're in the middle of it. Haven't got to that point yet, it's clear. And so even as we sing of Israel and God's relationship with Israel and our affinity with all that God has done for centuries and millennia, our hearts ache, ache at Israel today. So will you pray with me? Holy God, we know that you are near. We know that you are standing at the door. You are running down the driveway. You are inviting us in, into your word, into relationship, and deeper into joy. So as we approach your word, O oh God, we pray, do not let us pass you by. 
Do not allow distraction or doubt to get the best of us. Do not let us walk down this road without you and instead give us the wisdom to turn and run your way. Give us the wisdom to hear your wisdom, to let it sink into our bones and change us. With hope and gratitude we pray. Amen. This is the second Sunday in Advent. We're continuing in our series, How Does a Weary World Rejoice? And as Bill was saying last week, we began this series with an acknowledgement that we are all weary. And boy, was that hard. Boy, was that hard on some of y'all. Even if it was a comfort to some others. And there's good reason for that, that weariness. The news of the day has leveled us in some ways. We are still struggling with the after effects of the pandemic and the re-entry has not gone as smoothly as we'd hope. And some of us are dealing with health issues and to others the rising cost of living is a real kicker. Some of us are grieving and we can't seem to get out of it. And it's winter and even the sun seems to be conspiring against us, although that warm weather in November was a lovely reprieve. So we're weary. And we know that. And trying to avoid it or deny it or somehow wish it away won't solve anything. It won't bring us back to a place where we experience wholeness and health and optimism for a new day. The question that we hope to answer during this series is how to build joy in the midst of the weariness that surrounds us. What are tangible, faith-filled ways that joy can be practiced so that we are not overcome by the news or a diagnosis or the empty bank account or the empty chair or any other number of maladies that confront us? So the, today's theme is we find joy in connection. It begins with the idea that joy if it's really going to grow, must somehow be shared. That at the core of our humanity is this deep longing for relationship that compels us to connect with God or nature or other humans. We long to be seen, we say now, to be understood. We feel most whole when we are part of something bigger, when the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we long to share our lives with a love, a community, our planet. That is what it means to be fully human. That's how we find joy, even in our weariness. So there's three ways that I think this text encourages us to find joy in connection. It leads us to it. They are, number one, overcome the cringe. Number two, invite the Holy Spirit to birth something new. And three, share it. So first we're going to talk about overcoming the cringe because it's something we've all experienced. It's kind of the young folks use that term more. I mean, we know what it means, but it's an actual kind of noun, I guess, um, for them. Cringe happens when we do or say something that we later become embarrassed by. It's an awkward encounter that you live over and over again, something you did years ago that still leaves you feeling red-faced. You also feel cringe when you see someone else acting outside the social norms we've established, when someone else seems hopelessly old-fashioned and disconnected from our modern sensibilities. Sometimes uh, we feel cringe if we're not moving in the right direction and we know it and we think people see us and they're judging us. I gotta tell you, as a big person, I feel cringe every time I walk down an air, uh, air, what are they called? Planes, an airplane <laughs> aisle, because <laughs> they're so narrow, and I see people going, please don't sit next to me. I want to spread out. That is what cringe feels like. In an article in Refinery 21, Mabel Morgan defines this feeling of cringe. It means gut-wrenching, toe-curling, and almost nausea-inducing embarrassment, whether experienced first or second-hand. At its core, cringe means something that must be avoided at all costs. We don't like cringe. We don't like to be embarrassed, because embarrassment brings on shame. There was a time, 
the articles say that we shared our cringe moments as a kind of solidarity. I did this stupid thing, isn't that funny? Oh yes, I've done it too. Ah, isn't it good we've grown? Good thing we've learned from our mistakes, but no more. Because of the instant response of social media, we all feel like our lives are on display, like we are always being watched. People you don't even know come down hard on something you've said or something you believe, something you've worn, an idea you have. And so we all get this feeling that it's just better to keep it all to ourselves. Disconnection is the only way to save yourself from cringe, or so we think. And I wonder if cringe is what Mary and Elizabeth first experienced when they find out they're pregnant. And let's think about Elizabeth. Imagine this. The text says she went into seclusion for five months. Now, it might have been cultural. I don't know. doesn't tell us why she went into seclusion. I read some speculation that she was preparing for the birth of this miraculous child, that she was introverted and she needed time to process, that Zachariah couldn't speak and maybe she felt like she needed to be there in case something happened. These are more high-minded reasons about why Elizabeth went into seclusion, but I wonder if it didn't have more to do with her embarrassment. Elizabeth had wanted a child for years. She had mourned openly about her childlessness. And then Zachariah, he comes out of the temple that day literally speechless, and she finds herself pregnant. Too much to process. How will she explain this all? What will people think of her? She's too old to be having a child. Will they wonder about the child's parentage? And on and on. Perhaps Elizabeth is just too embarrassed to engage with anyone on the outside. Elizabeth is feeling the cringe and she doesn't know how to cope. 2023 began with a host of articles encouraging us all to abandon our fear of cringe. Those feelings of embarrassment. Um, the author of that article encourages us to own our awkwardness. To forget about what other people think. And more importantly, to just let others do their own thing. If we want to find joy in connection, we have to become vulnerable again. We have to reach out and step out and live without fear of cringe. Let your freak flag wave, in the words of that musical, Shrek. If you want to find joy, you have to let go of the cringe that isolates you. Let go of the embarrassment of your struggle with health issues or your grief that closes you off from your community. Let go of the social media gaze that limits what you say and how you dress and what you do. Let go of the comparisons of yourself to others that put up barriers between you and the world. Because when you try to protect yourself from the cringe, you block the joy. Second, invite the Holy Spirit to birth something new. Mary has this encounter with an angel, and the first thing they say to her is, Rejoice! In this time, back when Mary was alive, rejoice is a kind of salutation, a hello, that should put you immediately at rest. Be joyful, it says. Live with joy, it implies. Can you imagine if instead of hello, we greeted each other with, Be joyful! That would be so cringe. <laughs> Mary's spidey senses are on high alert when the angel tells her to rejoice, especially when they couple that rejoice with blessed are you among women. Okay, what do you want? The text says Mary is deeply troubled by these words, and so the angel counters with, oh, don't be afraid. You found favor with God, and tells her how she's going to have a child, and he's going to be really great, a king even. And Mary's curious now, but cautious. How's this going to happen? Because I've never been with a man, and that seems kind of out of the question for me. What exactly are you asking me to do? And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the child will be the Holy One of God. And as I read that, I mean, hidden in there is also that, blessed are you among women. 
And as I read the text, I'm struck by that phrase, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And if I wonder, I think that's the real key to finding joy in connection. I wonder if there isn't a sense that if we are going to live fully, become truly connected, find the joy that God has intended for us from the beginning, we don't all need the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Isn't the beginning of anything new the Holy Spirit coming upon us isn't the start of getting our, over ourselves and all our cringe moments that limit our joy and entering to what God would have us birth in our lives. The Holy Spirit come upon us. Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there will always be birth, something new, something wonderful. When I was thinking about this, Holy Spirit upon you, blessed are you, among women and wondering how that could be expressed. I thought of our good friend Anne Gardner. For those of you who don't know her, Anne was part of our community and many, many communities for years. And she died last November way too soon. If I think of a joyful person, she springs to mind. She had a smile that could just warm your heart. If you ever heard that, she smiled ear to ear. That was Anne. You let down your defenses when Anne smiled at you because you immediately felt like she was on your side. And Anne lived birthing that Holy Spirit thing. And she showed us the way, particularly during COVID. Because Anne didn't have any family. And as we know, COVID was most difficult for those who lived on their own. And many people just continued in isolation and are still recovering. Lots of people actually, I think, died of loneliness during COVID. And as the pandemic progressed, people felt more and more disconnected. But true to Anne's nature and the help of the Holy Spirit, she found a way to overcome the isolation. First, she knew she needed someone to love. And so she bought a dog, Tosh, beautiful, beautiful dog. And Tosh became her beloved companion. He was loved so completely. And then she found ways to stay connected and to give. And I can't tell you the number of times Anne would call me to say she'd made a meal for me and my family. And I could drop by and pick it up after we finished recording the services because that's what we did during COVID. And she lived just down the street. So I would go and she would have a box of a meal at the door. And we would exchange pleasantries and I would pet Tosh put it in my car, and we ate for a week on what Anne gave us. One time, she drove all the way to the Northwest where I live to drop a meal off for me because she found a way to create community even when we were in isolation. Anne had this weekly class she used to meet in the M&M room with some of her former students who lived with developmental disabilities. And when the classes had to stop, she found ways to visit them all. Some of you have seen the picture of Anne dressed up as a queen with a tiara and a wand even, and visiting each one of their homes so they would know that they were not forgotten. And at Christmas, Anne would take a bunch of gift cards for Tim Hortons to Alpha House where my son Jacob worked for the dope team, so they would enjoy some warmth as they cared for the homeless population in memory of her brother, who died unhoused. What Anne birthed during COVID was something wonderful. How did she do it? I could barely get out of bed some days. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Blessed are you among women. There is something to be birthed in you. And God is just waiting to open that connection so you can find your joy and birth something new in your life and be truly blessed. That's how we find joy. And finally, when you get over the cringe, maybe some say you get over yourself, and God births something new in you, then share it. Because hidden in that angel proclamation is this little tidbit. Well, hey, Mary... Your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant too. And Mary hurries to Elizabeth's house. Why? 
Is it to see for herself? Maybe a bit of gossipy curiosity? Imagine the conversations at the family dinners. Elizabeth's pregnant. Can you believe it? No, I think. Mary went to Elizabeth because she was looking for solidarity. She wanted to be with someone who understood her predicament. She wanted to offer support, to experience together this wonder that God has brought upon them both. She wanted to find joy in connection. And this, my friends, is how we dispel the cringe we are haunted by. This is how we allow the Spirit to come upon us and celebrate something that we are meant to birth in community, where joy can be fully lived together with each other. Because joy needs to be shared. It isn't lived until it's lived together. Even if sometimes you have to look real hard to find it. So the perfect example of this is the musicals we sometimes do here at the church. And I've been directing musicals for like 30 years. The process is always the same. As with any amateur production, you have a wide variety of abilities and different experience levels. And in the case of our shows, a wide uh, range of ages. I probably don't need to tell you that when we have our first rehearsals, they are pretty rough. Nobody remembers their lines. They forgot to practice the music. The dance steps are way out of sync. A lot of complaining goes on in those first few. Why are we doing this? Couldn't we make it simpler? Happens all the time. And if you looked at these rehearsals objectively, you would have to say they are a disaster. Now, I could give notes on all the things that went wrong, but I have made it a practice to celebrate the joy right from the beginning. So as we end each session, we finish with this. Give me 10 things that we're great about today. And now by the end, we can say, so-and-so really got that scene so beautifully, or she danced like an angel, or we finally got through it without stopping, which is always the greatest. But at the beginning, it's hard. We are still in the cringe phase of our rehearsals. The spirit is only beginning to come upon us. So this practice of finding joy, finding greatness, even in the awkwardness, is the Holy Spirit upon us and the birth of something new. And believe me, sitting in the wonderful, instead of focusing on the deficits, brings a community together in beautiful ways. So here today, as we finish, we're going to try this. Hopefully, we're going to find comfort in our connection with each other. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come upon us and birth something new out of our joy, because it's there. We have this narrative of decline that is through our culture, and definitely through the United Church, and even here. It's like those rehearsals that we have at the beginning, where we just look at all the things that are wrong and complain and wonder why we're doing this. And at the end... We say, what are 10 things that we're great about today? Bill's going to be here so the online folks can hear all about the joy. So I'm going to throw it open to you. This is it. Share your joy. 10 things that are great about this community that you call your spiritual home, these communities together. Okay, 10 things. I got to tell you at the beginning when I say 10 things that we're great about today, It's like pulling teeth. (laughs) So, raise your hand. Bill will come to you. Share 10 things. I'm counting. I love seeing how the neighbors get together to shovel each other's walks. Wonderful. Um, how welcoming this community is. Welcoming. That's two. Seeing all the gifts come in for the gifts that uh, hampers the church is giving out and and so happy that this program has gone on for years and years and years. Mm. Christmas hamper program that continues. Getting to hear the stories that make each of us unique. Mm. Stories of uniqueness, diversity, and community. The involvement of the community outside of the church. 
being part of the wider community, making sure we make a difference. That's five. And when times are tough, like, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. When times were tough in that kitchen, we just adjust, adjust, and readjust. <laughs> Flexibility in the kitchen is always a good thing. The family we have at McDougall. Mm. It is a family here in this community. All the wonderful meals we share together, and especially with people we haven't even met. Mm -hmm. The table at the center of our community. All the fantastic Christmas music. Mm. Christmas music. That's nine. One more. Looks like Carol. And that will be ten. All the, uh, the opportunity to greet people Sunday morning and all the hugs you get from the people that are so wonderful. The love that is shared even at the greeting door. Those are just 10 things that are great about this community and the wider community and the community we're sharing with Ogden. It is no small thing to find joy and connection. In fact, it is how we live out our faith in the most profound way. So I invite you to stand as we sing our final hymn together, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. As you leave this place, you go into a weary world, so speak tenderly. Do the good that is yours to do. Choose connection. Hold on to hope and remember that Christ took on flesh for you. You are God's beloved, so go rejoicing because the world needs it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all, amen.